today i will just take you through very briefly how natural history of our country was mapped who are the people who behind it and what was the process i'm a, not a great fan of what happened post partition so i will stop my chat at uh, at 47 uh, my talk is called an embarrassment of riches what i'm going to talk to you for the next hour or so is not even one of what wealth we have so it is truly and uh, an embarrassment of riches it's glimpses like i said from the mapping of india's natural history a lot of people ask me how did i get involved with my love for wildlife or natural history so i'll just give you a very brief uh, introduction i come from assam or at least my mother comes from assam we come from a small state called goripur where my grand uncle raja prakriti chandra barua was an elephant catcher besides being a ruler he was known as um, so what happened was that as kids we would go into elephant catching camps like very much like this picture we would build a kheda and two or three hundred of us tailors suitors cooks pandis mahouts we'd all go and set up camps sometimes for over a year and it was in that atmosphere that i uh, grew up this is my cousin is sitting here right in front of me this is our family we owned the largest private uh, array or amounts of elephants over 300 and this is the greatest of all our elephants pratap singh that's all of us as kids on it and how you catch an elephant is that you have trained elephant called kunkis and they come and they surround anyway so you come and surround uh, the wild elephants and you put them into the stockade and the ones you don't want you let them free and then starts a long three year old torturous uh, uh, period of training these elephants so it was under these circumstances that we grew up uh, we lived like a sort of jungle book mowgli kind of life till my father who's a chieftain from pakistan thought i was getting really spoiled in my maternal house plucked me from paradise and sent me to the world's worst boarding school where i spent the next 10 years of my life in jail <laughs> the earliest history of wildlife that i have been able to i have been able to find i'm not an expert i must put that caveat is in the bhimbetka caves in raisen district 35 kilometers out of bhopal where they have end of the stone age but 30 to 35000 years lots of seeds you can see elephants you can see this poor bird getting clobbered and this to me is the first significant finding there might have been uh, cave paintings earlier than that but this is what i have come across and i'll be quite happy to stand corrected then came the indus valley civilization 2600 to 1900 bc gujarat you had pictures of rhinos even of tigers elephants so obviously they existed there but strangely it is now the only place where you get the asiatic lion but that has never ever been represented in a seal of the indus valley people have many theories about it but that's outside the purview of this evening the vedas early vedas list 22 birds later vedas 224 i don't know who sat and read all the vedas and counted the birds i'm glad it's not me but you know it was all garbar that information in it how the chakor fell in love with the moon and kept looking at it till it fell backwards or the jacobin or chatak paki would only drink rain water and not regular water how the coil mate it it was that kind of more sort of ro romanticized thing but these were the earliest references then many years centuries nothing till the mauryas came and kautilya wrote the arthashastra now this is 2000 years back but he's not called kautilya for nothing he mentions that there must be an inspector for elephants you must grow certain kinds of forests 
So the first socio-economic forestry is mentioned in the Earth Shastra, and that was because you needed elephants for war, you needed wood for shipbuilding, and this is the first reference for. So it's like, then for several centuries, 12, 14 centuries, there's very little work done on natural history. With the coming of the Mughals, everything changes. Everything. The Mughals were amazing. Babur, who had a very brief stint in India, writes in the Babur Nama, which is an impossibly good read. He writes, for instance, that in my battle this morning, I have lost 4,000 men. My arm, I don't know whether I'll be able to save my arm. But as, as I was crossing the bridge, I saw a pair of birds that I haven't seen. And then spends the next 20 pages describing the common miner. You could look at pages from the Babar Nama. It is all to do with that. He lost the battle, he was fleeing. And a bird flew into his tent. So he stopped the march, his retreat, and wrote a description, got it painted. So he was the first. He had a very brief stint. Uh, but the Baba Nama, this is called Birds of Baran, which is a whole chapter that he's written in the Baba Nama. Akbar was spent too much of his time killing his brothers, becoming emperor. Uh, but because he was the richest, he had the finest painters in his court. So, willy-nilly, these painters uh, painted, and his great contribution was an illustrated version of a great book called the Tuti Nama. The Tuti Nama literally means Tales of a Parrot. It's a story of a woman called Khajosta, whose husband is a trader and it goes off on business for 60 days. And after, so he leaves a mina and a parrot to keep her company. By the second or third night, she gets fidgety and is looking for male company and wants to go out. So the miner raises a voice of dissent and she promptly kills him. So the Tota gets very worried and starts telling her stories like the Arabian Nights. And the stories are so fascinating for the next 60 days that she doesn't go out, by which time the husband comes back and all is well. Very much like this. So he got the first illustrated version of the Tuti Nama. And you can see some of these uh, fabulous paintings. He himself wasn't interested in that other than in hunting. But it was Jahangir. If Jahangir was not the emperor of India, he would have very much liked to be the director of the Bombay National History Society. <laughs> such was his obsession. Such was his obsession. He had with him several painters in his history. And it was Abul Hassan was one of the great ones. There's a fantastic painting of, uh, of a hunter catching a squirrel, the spotted fork tails, flowers. I mean, he was obsessed. And about this time, uh, the Mughal Empire is coming, is losing its glory. Other colonial powers, the Dutch, the French, the Portuguese, the British are all coming in, looking for concessions for trade. And how do you jump the queue? You bring the emperor a present of an exotic animal and you jump the queue. So Nazarana or bribe basically. So various people would bring him things like a zebra or a turkey. And he would then spend the next 50 pages describing his weight, his claws, his feathers, his everything get the best Scott painters to paint it. And this went on. And among the greatest, uh, uh, among the greatest of his painter was a chap called Ustad Mansur, who has never, I mean, he set the standard. He was called Amir, Amir Sayyid Dargah Nadir Al Asar Mansur Jahangir Shahi, or unique of the age. And he was the chosen, the thing, unfortunately, his flower paintings have disappeared, and I will tell you, I will spend one more minute on him. Mansur painted many paintings, some authentic to life, or some 
out of his own imagination, which were called fantastical as, instead of fantastic. But this is a Siberian crane which has not been seen in India from since 2000. It was described by Pallas in 1773. But 168 years before that, Mansoor had painted it in 1610. So 160 years before it was described to science, the court of Jahangir had already recorded it. The second one is also a 1610 painting of the dodo. The dodo was not an Indian bird. So some Portuguese traders seeking concessions brought it to Surat. Jahangir got news of it. He got it brought to his thing and got it painting. Then for some reason, these paintings disappeared and landed up at St. Petersburg Museum. And it was here in the 1968 Helsinki Ornithological Conference that this painting was produced. And an astonished world got to know what a dodo looked like from the court of Jahangir, where the bird does not exist. There were popular pastimes to do with nature, which they were recorded. There was Kabutar Bazi. There was cockfighting. And these were big pastimes, but there were nothing scientific. Right? There's a book on Kabutar Bazi, which was written in the 16th century. And falconry, where all the rich. This is a photograph of Dharma Kumar Singh Ji and Sadar Muhammad Osman. is banned now in India, but they were the two of the last falconers in this country. There was a book called Sayanika Shastra written about him. That's Mastani Begum uh, hunting. So while they were not scientific, they were recording on how falcons should be caught, how they should be trained. But it was with the publication of this book that real serious study started. This is pre-colonial. It is called Hortus Indicus Malabaricus or the Garden of Malabar. It was sponsored by Henrik van Reed, who was the Dutch governor of Cochin. It took many years in the making. And finally, it was 12 volumes of 200 pages each with 794 copper engravings. And all the plants, not all the plants, but the plants of Malabar were recorded. Unfortunately, as we are very good at doing, you can't find a copy of the book. It's gone out of, there was, he used people like Iti Achut and Vaidyan who were local medicine men, got their inputs and Hortus Malabaricus becomes now the first scientific word. It's, it was done in Latin. Uh, there is some attempts now to revive it. Some copper plates have been found in Amsterdam, but without official sponsorship, nothing can be done. And as you know, there is no official sponsorship. So very, very important uh, thing. Now what happens, as I told you earlier, the Mughal Empire is disintegrating. The painters of the Mughal Kalam, the Mughal painters are now getting out of job because they have no more patrons left anymore. So they have to look for new patrons. And who are these new patrons? But the new colonizers, the Dutch, the French, so there is a fusion in art of what we call the Mughal Kalam and the European style of art. And it came to be known as the company school, which is an awful word, but it was named after the East India Company. New techniques come in. Uh, gouache gives place to watercolor. Shadows are introduced. Perspectives are introduced. And this amalgamation of the company school painting is given birth. Now, wherever there were centers, Patna was a big center because there was opium money there. Calcutta, because of the British capital, had a big thing. There's a Delhi school. The Marathas were in Tanjore. So there's a Maratha school of company painting. And what they would do, they would not only record wildlife, but they would record everything, people, temples, this thing, millions and millions of them. And they would replicate them and used mostly like a postcard. This school of thought of painting came to an end with the discovery of photography and then it died. So here are some examples of company school paintings. I have naturally stuck to the natural history part, but they give us a great amount of information of what they were. 
These are mostly from the barracks, bar barrack port, this thing, stingrays, body laos, bear, the hula gibbon. The hula gibbon is now of an East Assam uh, animal, but so obviously somebody brought it to Calcutta, fish, cheetah, which we will talk about later. Same with plants, pepper, and some of them combined birds and this thing uh, together, so you can get a perspective of what was available. Where. But the queen of all company school paintings was a lady called Lady Mary Impe, who was the wife of the first Chief Justice of India called Sir Elijah Impe. Their house in Middleton Row was a menagerie. She employed the best painters, mostly from the Patna school, and got them to document the animal life and bird life of this area. Her husband was then caught in a scandal with Hastings in what is known as the famous, infamous Raja Nand Kumar case. They were discharged, went with, sent back to England where they were cleared. But she, this is a painting of the family by the famous French painter Zoffany. And when they went back, these paintings were then sold and distributed and got hold of some scientists. And, and the bottom left is the photograph of the Monal pheasant. And it was from this painting that it was introduced to science. And therefore, it is called Lophophorus impeianus after Lady Impe. From her collection was also the first painting of the pig hindered duck, which, was, which went extinct in India in 1936. Some of these paintings are very difficult to get hold of. It's taken me a lifetime to find them for you. Her three main painters, Bhavani Das, Ram Das, and Sheikh Zainuddin. Today, you find an original Sheikh Zainuddin, it's going to cost you about $25 million. A uh, lot of them are in private collections. But they painted amazing, this uh, painting of the fruit bat sold for, I think, five and a half million about 10 years back. Similarly, to reflect, there was a Deccan school, which was the southern Indian part of it, balsam, sugar cane. But it was with the coming of the East India Company, the Honorable East India Company. It was the least honorable company in the world, but it was the first great. Well, I'm, there are lots of businessmen here, so I better keep quiet. Uh, Sir Thomas Rowe first. Uh, British ambassador to India. Kosim Bazar was the famous opium uh, uh, factory. They used to make opium. They, con they converted China into a country of addicts, of opium addicts, so that they could feed uh, the, all the opium there. This is that Leadenhall Street in London where there was. And, but it brought with them a huge number of soldiers, uh, officers, medical people, it was like running a country. And with the fall of Lucknow in 1857, the East India Company passed on to Lady Queen Victoria, who was made by Disraeli. She was made the Empress of India. And this is Abdul Karim, her faithful servant. Some not so nice people have other things to say. But I will reserve my judgment. But he, she was very, very funny. He came to a sticky end in the end after she died. So these are the people from the start of the East India Company and its officials that the real work started. The Asiatic Society of Bengal was started by William Jones on the 15th of January, 1874. And they started the Asiatic Society of Journal, which became the repository of all study done on natural history. Very briefly, there was a Calcutta Journal of Natural History. You can't find these anywhere anymore. But that died. The Asiatic Society later became the National Museum. Uh, if you go there, it's a sad sight today. But till uh, the BNHS Journal took over, the Asiatic Society Journal, it still makes fascinating reading. James Ford was a civil servant, mostly worked in the Narbada uh, region. He uh, worked in India for 20 years. When he left India, he left with 54,000 pages of paintings and writings. 
When he went back, he did Oriental Memoirs in four volumes. Uh, amazing paintings. This is the bird painting of the buyer. It's the first lithograph ever done in the world. I have one. Uh, and Bitu, this will interest you. In the Oriental Memoirs, there was a painting of a black tiger, which nobody still has been able to figure out. And so they were men as worthy as uh, James Forbes. Before I go on a little bit further, I want to put in hunting in this. Hunting was a big sport, a big, big sport in India. This is pig sticking where you went on horseback and you stuck a spear into. The army in India used to follow it quite till recently. Uh, on the sandbanks of uh, the Ganga near Meret, pig sticking competition of the cavalry regiments. It was called the Khadir Cup. The Khadir is, means the sandbank along a river, which has now mercifully been stopped. Uh, so hunting was a big part of tradition and we'll talk a little bit more about it. The government of India, prior to 1971, used to put out ads in foreign journals inviting people to come and hunt tigers in India. Till quite recently, till the 60s. You can see this is a very famous site of a caracal with a cheetah sitting on a bed who we were trained for hunting. Look at this servant with so many tigers killed. I mean, I have with me 5,000 pictures of like this. And this is a shoot where 380 tiger leopards were killed on the Nepal border. And what was the myth was that the British built up a myth that if you killed a tiger, you were a man. And you know, yeah, this man is saving his colleague from the jaws of a tiger. This is a famous duck shoot in uh, Bharatpur where, on a, where they were bored. If you go to Bharatpur, you'll see 4,000 ducks killed on one day. <clears throat> this photograph is called All in a Day's Work. This is the title of the photograph. Bears, I think six tigers. Now, I will go back to this a little bit, but I will just, uh, we have some time. I have half an hour or so. Uh, uh, so, I'll just go through mammals. This is a caracal. This is Brian Hodson, who was a British civil servant who was sent, the British never got hold of Nepal, so they sent a resident. He stayed in Nepal for 12 years without like, leaving the valley. He was not allowed to leave the valley. So he sent out people. He has 107 mammals which he discovered new to science by sitting in a valley, not being able to. He was a civil servant. He worked, calculated. Look at the drawings of all the bladders. He calculated how many, what is the pregnancy term of an Indian rhino. And wrote copious notes about it. Robert Armitage Turnell was an indigo planter in Tirhut in Bihar. He was an indigo planter. He was not a zoologist. He wrote the first book called The Mammals, History of Indian Mammals and Mammalia of India. Never been, never studied zoology, but wrote the first book. He also wrote something called the Sioni Camp Life of the Satpura Ranges. And it was from this book that Rudyard Kipling got inspiration and wrote the Jungle Book. If you remember, the wolf pack is called the wolf pack of Sioni. There was Sterndale, there was Lidica. Lidica was a, worked in the Geological Survey of India. Spent his time looking for something called the Ramapithecus on the Uttarachal, uh, Uttarakhand, uh, Haryana border. But he wrote the great and small games of India. Look at the illustrations that they painted. Major General Hardwick, professional soldier, made, spent his life fighting in India. But wherever he got, he got local people to paint. Insects, turtles, fish. And after retirement, he, uh, his ship uh, sank. He lost his insect volumes. But in two volumes, produced illustrations from Indian zoology, 204 plates, of which 98 are on birds. Prater, 
Anglo Indian community for many years, the editor of BNHS wrote the first book which Bitu and I used because that was the only book available till recently on Indian mammals. Later represented the Anglo Indian community in the legislature. Now we come back. This is a lovely miniature painting from Kota on the tiger. I'll keep going forth, backwards and forwards. We spoke about the tiger. The tiger is venerated as the Vahan of Durga. But in the popular imagination, you can see the tiger killing or frightening a lady. And this is Maharaj Ram Anuj Pratap Singh Deo of Sarguja, who in his lifetime killed 1,743 tigers, which is more than the population of tigers as they exist today. But it was the same thing about how you want to be a man. The Asiatic lion reduced to 12 when Nawab Mahabad Khan of Junagadh was forced to invite Curzon, who was not a good man, because it's to shoot uh, a lion. But, uh, I mean, Mahabad Khan was very, very upset, but he was a viceroy, he had to say yes. But a Bombay newspaper uh, picked up the story. And Lady Curzon, who was also not a nice lady, decided to back the tiger. This thing. Now, the lions have gone back to 500. Uh, in fact, the area where they live is too small. We all tried in our own ways to find a new place where we could translocate them, called Kuno Palpur in Madhya Pradesh. Our current Prime Minister, who was then Chief Minister, said, no, these are Gujarati lions, they will remain in Gujarat. So, despite a Supreme Court order uh, ordering uh, the transfer of lions into Kuno Palpur, nothing has been done. Our Chief Minister has got a promotion, so nothing really is going to be done. This is Maharaja of Patiala with his lion. Cheetah, lovely painting by George Stubbs, the English animal painter. He got, he never been to India, he got it all wrong. He put a Scottish tag at the back. But this is how, uh, how uh, paintings were done. This to blindfold the cheetah. Now, the same Ram Anuj Singh, the killer of the tigers, in 1947, shot the last three cheetahs in a small state called Korea and Madhya Pradesh. Here is him killing the last three cheetahs that existed in India. And then had the gumption to write to the BNHS saying, I have shot the last three cheetahs in India. The letter is available in Bombay. But cheetahs were used for hunting. So since 1947, there's no cheetahs in India. Uh, you know how they were trained. Akbar used to use them, cheetahs for hunting black buck. This is a lovely painting by the botanist Maria North in Alwar of cheetahs and caracals sitting on charpais being trained for this thing. But the cheetah story is over, I'm afraid. Elephants, mostly for three things. Hunting, now no longer used. War, no longer used. Log timber logging, no longer used. So it's only for ceremonial purposes. It is largely unknown that the real conflict in India, man-animal conflict, is really to do with the elephant problem. We call it a problem. In Assam, in North Bengal, other places, they take tar, set it on fire, and chuck it at the elephant so it sticks to the body. It's that bad. It's real, really thing. Uh, we don't have very much time. Reptiles and amphibians. Patrick Russell, after whom the Russell's Viper was named, came post-retirement from Syria because he had a brother who lived in Vishaka Patna who was not well. So the family sent him post-retirement. He comes to India. He's a doctor. Becomes the, the, the authority on snakes and writes an account of Indian serpents. He also writes a book on fish of the eastern coast. Post-retirement. So he's about 70 when he's come becomes the foremost. This is what the caliber. Today we are becoming experts on, more and more experts on a smaller number of things. We are, and a date will come that we'll know everything about nothing. Joseph Fryer writes a book on the venomous snakes, but he's the man who calls the tiger, writes a book on the tiger, and the term Royal Bengal Tiger comes from his book, The Royal Bengal Tiger. He's a physician, herpetologist, president of the Asiatic Society. 
and is an expert at snakes, expert in tigers. The rather gruesome photograph of a tiger in the Sundarbans taking away a human. Colonel Bedouin, nobody has heard of him. Nobody. Some hardcore says this Bedouin is cat snake. He has 1,000 things named after him. A thousand different species covering ferns, snakes, sponges, shells, writes two books on plants. Colonel Bedome, unsung, dead. This is how we treat our grades. Gunther Albert, never, he's, a, he's a classic example of an armchair zoologist. He lives in England, he's German. He writes the first book on reptiles of British India, never having come to India. From museum species sent to him. Malcolm Smith is a doctor and a snake expert in the British Army. So they write, till today, till today, these books are used by students of the Wildlife Institute. Joseph Ivart, Indian Army doctor, Frank Wall, Indian medical surgeon, writes on snakes because snakes is that time the big problem in the country. Insects. This is the Kaiser Hind or the Empress of India, the most uh, beautiful butterfly that exists in this country. Edward Donovan, who is an Irish armchair naturalist, writes the first book called Insects of India. He's never been to India, so what does he do? He buys other collectors' stuff. And he mixes up the East Indies with the West Indies. <laughs> and, but what it does is, he does beautiful paintings of butterflies, whether they're from which part of the world. Frederick Moore, Museum of the Austin Naval Company in Calcutta, Colonel Swinhoe, writes a book on Lepidoptrica Indica. In 10 volumes, he dies, Colonel Swino takes over, but Colonel Swino has a Swino's mini wet named after him, a bird. He also writes the birds of the Museum of the East India Company. So he's an expert on snakes, he's an expert on birds. Today, if we want to be an expert, we have to be an expert on the size of the left toe of the right foot of a something. Marshall. Marshall writes a book, Bird Nesting in India. He also writes a book on butterflies. Bingham, Army, Irish Army officer, writes on butterflies. And Mark Winterblith, who teaches in Rajkumar College in Rajkot, writes the book that we, in our start of our life, used. And now, of course, there are more modern guides. And, but these were the caliber of the people who documented this country. Hampson writes on moths, Coates writes on moths. There isn't till today a book on Indian moths. So if you're doing your MA or your MPhil, you have to go back to people born in the 1860s. And they're very, very good. Ronald Ross, Mr. Malaria, he's born in a, to a general in Almora, becomes a doctor, studies abroad, comes back, gets very bored. They send him to look after the plague in South India. <clears throat> Dying. He's a poet. So instead of doing, he writes poetry, he writes plays, he performs them, he sings. And he's trying to figure out what uh, the malaria mosquitoes. And he can't figure it out. And then he goes to a place called Sigurghat near Uti when he sees uh, this mosquito, which he called the dapple wing. So he captures some of them and finds a poor chap called. Hussein, Hussein Khan, who he pays 50 paisa to get bitten. <laughs> so Hussein Khan keeps getting bitten by this mosquito and develops malaria. So our friend Ross is very, very excited. So he takes the mosquito, I don't know what instruments they have, dissects the mosquito and finds a para parasite, the, mala uh, the malaria mosquito. I mean, how you did it in those days. Comes back and writes, a note and then also writes a song about how he discovered malaria. Goes to be the first uh, person to be born in India to win the Nobel Prize in medicine, starts the Ross Institute. So such were the men. Fish. There was Francis Day and Sundarlal Hora, the first, uh, the first uh, uh, what you call, uh, Director General of the ZSI and also the progenitor of the Satpura hypothesis. But the study of fish in India was more from a shikar point of view than from a scientific point of view. There were wonderful books like The Mighty Mahasair by Skin Dew or The Rod in India 
and they were all about hunting of one fish, which is the mahasir, which is the greatest fighting fish, freshwater fish. And this really nearly put the great jungle fowl, which is a bird, a jungle fowl of South India over the teak forest, uh, almost got uh, eliminated because the hackles of the great jungle fowl were used for making the flies to catch the mahasir. Birds, my, this thing. The first report, this is, nobody has seen this, these pages, was written in, well, sometimes in early 70s, when by Lieutenant Surgeon Edward Buckley, who wrote a pa uh, the first report saying 22 birds from Fort St. George in 19, 1730. He sent it to Jonas Rye, who published it, and this was the first, first bird report ever sent from anybody in India. It took me years to dig it out. John Fleming, who wrote a book on plants and drugs, medicinal plants and drugs, also got in Calcutta, painted the first uh, semi, let's say, accurate description of birds. This folio went to the Tagore family who donated it to the Victoria Memorial where it resides rather precariously. There was John Gould, the world's greatest painter, did 3,999 paintings never having come to India. And he did, he documented Indian birds like nobody before, like June's. This is Mrs. Gould's sunbird, there is Gould shortwing. This is the, uh, another bird I think is now uh, been gone from this thing. And he also painted the first thing, the painting of the mountain quail which has not been seen from 1782. He painted it from a private collection called Nosley Hall in England. So this is a, a lafafa of a letter sent to him, which I found I bought for one pound in England when I was a student there. His wife, poor Elizabeth Gold, died at the age of 28, having given birth to six children. But she did all the early work while he made all the money. He was a very good businessman. He used to pre-sell his books. And and he used to have the poet Edward Lear, the nonsensical poet, uh, helping. And she, he helped Elizabeth Gold. And it is really seven volumes of Birds of Asia and one volume of A Century of Birds from the Indian Himalayas, 98 plates, priceless. Samuel Tickle, the greatest bird reporter in India, born in Katak, married in Katak. I went to Katak to look for his house. I found his grave. Nobody in Odisha had heard about him. He wrote, his, he lost his eyesight, so both his books, uh, are, uh, manuscripts on the mammals of India and the birds of India are in, the, uh, are in England at Tring, but he was a colonel. Edward Blythe, the first curator of the Asiatic Museum, he came to India on a salary of 40 pounds, 20 years later, he still left on the same salary, he didn't get a raise in 20 years, poor chap. So he started dealing with circuses and sneaking out, smuggling stuff and all. Poor chap got caught too. But he became mad. I mean, so would I if I didn't get a raise in 20 years. Thomas Kavar Jensen writes the first book called The Birds of India. This is a photograph of the first uh, bird meeting ever taken place. He also writes a book on fish. He's He's not interested in anything else. He dies a destitute because he hasn't looked after his finances. But writes the birds of India, which then becomes the repository of all the information on birds that exist. Alan Octavius Hume, more better known as the founder of the Indian National Congress, which now such our friend Rahul Gandhi heads, but he was the founder. He was a civil servant. He could never get along with, uh, uh, with his bosses. And uh, so they were quite happy to get rid of him. So he goes and buys a house called Rothney Castle in Simla, where he said he would write his famous book called The Birds of the British Empire. And he goes uh, to Simla and uh, starts writing. He, he has produced many, many books, including 11 volumes of a journal called The Stray Feathers. He has a whole team network of writers, correspondents, who write in their reports to him, and which he then puts together. And so he's going to write his great book. 
and he comes down to Ambala in winter because it's snowing in Simla and his servant burns all his notes to keep warm. He comes back to Simla, sees what has happened, says, I will not uh, see another bird again, donates 73,000 skins and 74,000 eggs to this thing, goes back to England, gets two grasses named after him. So this was the quality of the men. There is he at uh, the founding of the uh, uh, Indian National Congress. Blandford, who was in the meteorological department, but becomes the editor of the fauna of British India, covering 20 different subjects, all published and sold for rupees one only. Stuart Baker, another great favorite of mine, he's a police officer. And I have a letter which I, I found somewhere which he writes to one of her several girlfriends <clears throat> saying, Dear Gertrude, I couldn't write to you earlier because my arm has just been chewed up by a leopard. <laughs> but he writes many books on, but those days bird books are written more from a shikar point of view, you know, identifying ducks, identifying other birds of uh, hunting, uh, birds that you could hunt. But he wrote Indian pigeons and doves, he wrote uh, Indian ducks and their allies, game birds of India and three, this thing. but a great, great man. Unfortunately, uh, his records are no longer, you know, people don't think that he did a thorough enough job. But still my favorite. He also wrote a book on Mishti the Man-Eater. Frank Finn, <coughs> Indian Museum, writes about mammals. Gets the Finn's buyer named after him. Douglas Dewar, ICS officer, writes 30 books. Birds of the Indian courage. He's, these are not bird watchers. These are interested people. He's not a trained ornithologist. Hugh Whistler, another po po uh, policeman. First popular handbook of Indian birds that Bitu and I, when we were youngs, were used by written by Whistler. Unsung. Nobody knows about them. M. Krishnan, our great favorite. 46 years he wrote a column called Country Life for 46. Years he wrote a column for the statesman. The last column was published the day he died. He was a school teacher. EPG was a perhaps the first of the real wildlifers. He wrote a book called Wildlife of India. Discovered the uh, golden langur in Manas near where I was brought up. None of them were zoologists. But they had the ability to write. Salim Ali. Greatest birdman in India. Uh, 14 volumes of his book. I have all 14 editions. Didn't get a bird named after him till last year, where I really had to work hard. There is a Salim Ali fruit bat, bat. There is a Salim Ali swift, which was not found in India. It was only last year when we found that the, we split a species that the lower of the plain-backed mountain thrush, we called it Salim Ali's thrush. Last year, the world's greatest, uh, India's greatest. Uh, quickly, I'm coming to an end. Uh, flora and fauna, Robert Kidd, army officer, so interesting plant, was told to start the botanical garden in Sippur. You can see the early stages of the plantation. Roxborough, house in Howrah, they all work, they collected plants. Those of you who get the Bombay uh, mirror, my article appears tomorrow on, on something like this. So uh, I never read what I write, but it would be interesting to get a feedback. Uh, Wallach, again, his check comes to India, also gets the chief as a, named after, a bird named after him writes plant Asiatic, the rare plants of Asia. Robert Wright uses two Telugu painters, Rangia and Govindu. He's a surgeon, works on South India. You know, unfortunately, it's the Edinburgh University that has all this repository. It's not in India. And there's a chap called Henry Nolte, who's now the expert on Indian plant life. And there is nothing in India. Nobody cares, nobody. And in a way, it's good it's not here because 
either it be eaten by termites or sold. Hooker comes, I mean, if you look at a plant, it's either Hookeri or Oxybergiae or Walaichi. These are the guys who opened up. He went to Sikkim. I mean, I can give you a talk on each one of them individually. They did so much contribution. Cleghorn. Cleghorn was a physician. Later became head of the forest department of Madras and later became the inspector general of forests in India. A chap who trained to be a doctor. Look at his work. Look at the way they wrote their, uh, their notes. For lack of time, Brandes was a German who started the FRI. Also wrote the forest flora of uh, India, central India. Blatter, who is a priest, Millard, to whom... Um, who used to run the fifth son's office in, in, uh, in Bombay and to whom Salim Ali went. They wrote books on beautiful Indian trees. These are classic books. Unfortunately, you can't find them because nobody's interested. Faisal worked in South India and named the first, the only rod rhododendron that you get in India. And as we come to an end, I want to tell you a little bit about the storytellers, the soothsayers. This is somebody like me giving gyan to uh, unsuspecting uh, audience. Frank Kingdom Ward was an Englishman. You know, plant collecting was a big, big thing. You made a lot of money. So he would come to India in search of plants, which he would then sell to collectors. Big money. There were many of them who came to India. And his great discovery was the finding of the blue poppy, which he hadn't seen, but a friend of his called Colonel Bailey had seen. And then he goes and finds and plants. And today, it's a great story. He wrote, he traveled in the Mishmi Hills, which you can't even travel now if you want to. He did it so many years back, almost uh, more than 100 years back. He also has the Ward Strogan named after it. So these were the great people who came back and wrote stories about their travels. Jim Corbett, all of you have heard of. This is where the Bachelor of Powellgird, which the, the famous uh, Rudra Parayak Leopard. Fantastic writing, uh, helped by Hawkins, who was the head of OUP in this thing. My only battle with against Corbett is that willy-nilly, and certainly not out of his choice, uh, intention, he managed to put the thought in everybody's mind that all tigers are man-eaters. That's his gun. Um, and fantastic writer. Kenneth Anderson, Jim Corbett of the South, little bit of a bullshitter. <laughs> Not great literature either. General Hamilton, who wrote, though he was a general, he was very interested. Sports in Southern India, does amazing paintings. But these people have already now started speaking about concern, concerns of forest dying, concerns of species dying. Dunbar Brander, who was an Indian Forest Service, George Sanderson, who was in charge of PWD, and also a great elephant catcher in Mysore. They write the wild beasts of India, uh, the wild animals of central India. They are now raising questions. It's already started 100 years ago, concerns. What is happening? What is happening? Stebbings, another, he was a forester and an entomologist, a forest uh, insects he used to deal with. In his book, Jungle Byways in India, has said <coughs> India is going to turn into a desert. He talks about desertification and the desiccation already. This was, he died in 1960, but was born in 1872. In the 40s, he has started talking about what people, Bitu and all, now talk. 20 years back. Saying that the desert is coming up, you're cutting too many trees, you're not doing... So these alarm bells have started. And this is my favorite painting, which has everything. Plas, birds, moths, calligraphy. This is exactly what we should be looking at in all aspects. Our quest must go on. And with that, I thank you very much. So I know that, of course, in I would say this was a bit of both. It was a bit of both. In India, we didn't have 
we had traditions of making records like I was talking to one uh, uh, Malabaricas. Iti Apan and all used to have palm leaf uh, uh, manuscripts. But they were again very detailed. Uh, obviously, they didn't have the finances or the abilities like the, for, like the colonials have. To, so it's wrong to, for me to say that there was very little work. But uh, I think the serious work really stopped after the colonials left or the British left. Because I have little respect for the scientific done, work done in the recent decades. And that's a personal choice. And uh, so I think it's best for me to keep out of the controversy. Uh, you know, that kind of work. Today, tell me uh, what is coming out of Indian science. Peter Smetacek is like me. We write books. He writes on butterflies, I write on birds. But, you know, very, very good chap. His book is, his autobiography is fabulous. But in real work, you know, like Sari Mali trekking all over the world, uh, all over India for months on end, no food, pani shani. I don't think that's been done anymore. The most detailed uh, documentation I have come across of a geography region like Kool in the Gazette. Yes. Just probably that by army officer. By district collectors who were actually who should do it. Absolutely. I mean, it, it is a repository of such high order. And, but how many people know about gazetteers? You know? And you just can't. Uh, uh, so, my question is yes. it, just, it seems to me that the people of that time and from that area, like from the UK, yeah. uh, from Britain, yeah. There were details of religion, caste, demography, everything was, uh, uh, was documented. I will be quite happy to answer questions outside at any point of time. Thank you.